So in this video, I'm going to be comparing the base Mac Studio Ultra with the 48 GPU cores to a 16 inch MacBook Pro with 32 GPU cores and doing the exact same export from the exact same edit timeline within DaVinci Resolve. And let's see what the differences are in the final export times. So the first thing that I'm going to test is the Mac Studio. So if I come up to here and go to about this Mac, as we can see here, this is saying Mac Studio with the Apple M1 Ultra chip in it. So that's that out the way. Now what I'm going to do is just get into Resolve and I will show you a bunch of things in Resolve about the setup. First thing being the version. So as we can see here, this is 17.4.5 build 7. And of course, I will use the exact same version and the same setup when I switch over onto the MacBook Pro M1 Max. Now, as far as the resolution and such is concerned, as we can see here, this is 4K UHD and it is 25 frames per second. Now, the next thing to show you is the actual playback settings as far as anything like proxy media is concerned and optimized media. So as we can see here, there is no optimized media going on. There's also no proxies. And as far as the timeline proxy mode is concerned, that's switched off so we're at full resolution in the timeline. Then as far as render cache is concerned, there is none. And then there's also no fusion memory cache. And this is actually quite important because some of these titles are actually fusion titles as well. And just to be doubly safe here, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to delete render cache. Not that there should be any, but let's just delete it anyway, just in case. So as it stands right now, there is absolutely no optimization going on here. So what I'm gonna do here is just explain a few things about the timeline. And this is very important because this is going to have a direct effect on the speed of the export or the encode at the end. When I say export and encode, in this sense, we're talking about the same thing, just producing a final H.265 file. So what happens is the encoder is fed a signal from a video buffer. And what happens is the video buffer is basically a mix of everything that we see here in the timeline. Now, if you're used to working with audio, you can think about it in a similar sense to an audio mix. You can have a number of different tracks and then what happens is you mix them down to say two tracks. So you've got a stereo mix. Well, a video buffer in the sense of an edit system like this is very similar. You have a number of different tracks with say video or say titles or whatever. And what happens is that all gets mixed down into one buffer. So you can think of your buffer as like your stereo mix output in the sense of when we're talking about say audio mixes and stuff. So what happens then? All of these tracks here, they get fed into a buffer system and then that buffer system is then what gets fed into the encoder. Now of course, the encoders have a certain speed that they can operate at. However, that speed can't be reached unless the video buffer can actually feed the data into the encoders at a particular speed. So effectively, the encoders are kind of gonna get slowed down by the speed of the video buffer, and the video buffer is then made up of all the assets within the edit here. So the more complex the edit, and if indeed, if the edit needs any kind of rendering, then the video buffer will take longer to build up, in which case it will get fed slower into the encoder. Now, hopefully that's kind of like, you know, the most basic explanation I can do here without going into like a lot more detail. And hopefully this is going to give people an idea of what's going to happen once we go and do the export. Now, with all that said, this timeline here is like, it's, it's a very lightweight edit, shall we say, and it's definitely something that both of the systems can easily handle. So what this means is, when I do the export, this timeline will get fed faster than real time into the video buffer, and that's because both systems 
are like a lot more powerful than what this timeline requires so that speed going into the video buffer will then mean we can feed the encoder as fast as we can now the fastest way we could ever feed the encoder would probably be something like a low resolution timeline with just a single track of video that might be the easiest way to actually test the speed of the encoder ultimately however what i'm obviously doing here is to see what a typical edit would do when we hit the encoder okay so with all that said hopefully once again this has given people a bit more of an idea of exactly what's going to be going on i will however do similar tests to this further down the line where i do stuff which does require rendering and where we don't build up any proxies and we don't build up any pre-caching and then that will actually show the opposite effect of what i'm trying to achieve here and that is where we deliberately slow down a timeline in order to see its effect on the encode at the end now just quickly let me just run through the timeline so the top track here this has got a single static title which is this url in the bottom left here now the next track down here which is video track three that's got four kind of like slight motion graphics i say slight here we go they're just little quick titles so i'm just going to do a that's like a basic motion title now interestingly here these titles do actually require the use of fusion now what i actually found a bit odd here is these titles obviously look really simple and they are however they kind of seem to disproportionately take a bit more processing power than what you might think they ought to so this is one of the weirder things that i find with resolve some of these simple looking titles actually do tax it a little bit again we're well within real time here but nonetheless they do actually take up a little bit of processing and stuff like that so they're the motion titles that i've got now this track here and this track here or the, these edits on both of these tracks video track two and three these are basically coming from two or three takes just chopped up and cut down and what these are are sony xavcs video files i don't know the what it is if we have actually have if we have a look at the inspector it doesn't actually tell us that it's actually the sony codec but it is sony xavcs once again nothing too heavy for the actual timeline and again just so that we can get through it as fast as possible and feed it into the encoder as fast as possible and then what we've got here are a few tracks of audio two dialogue tracks and one music track and um, what it is with the audio here if we have a look on the fairlight page um, we've basically got a some instances of like loud max here which is a limiter so i'm using limiting here to level the actual mix out rather than use the faders as you can see here the faders are basically null position except for the audio so i actually do this quite a bit especially for stuff with youtube i actually tend to mix with a limiter and basically use the threshold output from the limiter to determine the mix and stuff some people might look at that and go dave that's a bit lazy however it does actually give you quite a finished output and something that's quite loud as well so it's probably something that people might want to have a little crack at themselves anyways there we go that's the basic boring stuff about what's in the timeline and how it affects things so let me just now flip over to the exporter okay so i'm onto the export page now and as we can see here where it says render it says in out range and that's because i'm just going to select a part of the timeline so i've put my in point down here and my out point down here and that is nine minutes and 43 seconds worth of timeline now it's a good job i personally use the io range here because as we can see the rest of the timeline's got a ton of junk in it because i'm dead messy but nonetheless i'm exporting out nine minutes and 43 seconds worth of timeline now what i'm going to do is just quickly go through these settings here i'm not going to explain why and anything like that i'm just going to have to go through them because i'm going to have to reproduce these when i go onto the map MacBook. so as far as the format or the container or the wrapper is concerned i'm using mp4 as far as the video codec is concerned i'm using h.265 and very importantly this box here is ticked which says use hardware acceleration if available obviously because i want to use the hardware accelerator 
Also at this point, if I click on audio, I'm using 320 kilobits per second, and I'm using the AAC audio codec. Now, technically speaking, you can use other types of audio codecs within MP4. However, some things may not recognize it if you do that. So always use AAC for your MP4 files as far as the audio codec is concerned. Now, if we come further down here, resolution is 4K UHD in keeping with the resolution of the timeline, as is the frame rate is 25, just like the timeline is. So basically what we've got going in is what we've got going out as far as resolution and frame rate is concerned. Now down here, I've just got restrict the, uh, the bit rate here for the video bit rate, and that is 100,000 kilobits per second. Again, I won't get into why I've chosen that. I will do that in another video. Now also, I have unticked optimize for speed. Now, if you have that ticked, it will go faster. However, there's a reason why I untick it, and that's because, very briefly, it does have an impact on a certain type of quality to do with the encode. So unticking it makes the encode go a bit slower. However, it does actually increase a certain type of uh, like fidelity within the video. Again, I can't go into too much detail about that. However, I will do in the future. Now also, as far as the encoding profile is concerned, I'm using main 10. Now could be argued here that I could just go to main. However, and despite the fact that I've got mostly 8-bit assets in the timeline, as in XAVCS, I will choose 10-bit because there are certain advantages to delivering 10-bit even if your source was predominantly 8-bit. Again, I won't go into that right now because it's a very long, boring thing to talk about. Uh, you can't select multi-pass because you can't do that with H.265 within Resolve at this point. And then also as well, everything else is basically as is. So what we're looking at here is effectively like just a couple of alterations from what would be selected if you go MP4 H.265 as standard when you select it in Resolve anyway. And then what I've done, I've just lobbed it over into my render queue here. Now, just before I hit render, what we're going to notice is dead quickly, and I'm not going to like play this all the way through as it renders, but what we will notice at the beginning there's going to be a number up here, which is like how many frames per second is being encoded. We will see that probably be quite low. And then once this edit starts getting a bit further in, that number up here will go up. And the reason for that is, is because at the beginning, there's those little like motion graphic title things, and they will slow the rendering down a bit. And then once it gets past them, it will get faster once it gets into the bulk of that video there. So let's hit render all and see what happens. Boom. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so as we can see, it's kind of going up and down a bit there, and that's in keeping with those motion titles and stuff. Anyway, what I'm going to do now is just speed through this, and I'll get to the end, and let's make a note of the time that it takes to do the export. Okay, so as we can see there, that took two minutes and 37 seconds in order to export a nine minutes and 43 seconds section of this timeline. Now, as I've already stated from the outset of the video, this is just purely to do with timings. I'm not gonna play the video because it's got nothing to do with picture quality or anything. Now what I'm going to do is just flip over onto the MacBook and let's do the exact same thing. Okay, so I'm over onto the MacBook now, and if I just come up to about this Mac, as we can see here, Apple M1 Max. So what I'm gonna do is just get into Resolve here. I will now go over all the basics again, just so that we know that we are like for like and stuff. So first thing is, let's have a look at what version of Resolve I'm on, and that is 17.4.5 build seven. Now, if I come up to playback up here, once again, no optimized media, no proxies. Timeline mode is basically off of the proxy. And then also render caching, there is none. And fusion and stuff like that is off. But once again, what I'm gonna do here is just delete render caching, just in case there may have been anything laying around from somewhere else or what have you. Then on top of that, let me just quickly come down here. As we can see, it is 4K 20 or 4K UHD to be precise, 25 frames per second as far as the project is concerned. 
and that's basically everything all sorted as we can see it's the same edit all the same tracks and all that type of stuff so what i'm going to do now is just flip over onto the exporter now i've given this a title max and as we can see here the format is mp4 codec h.265 i'm also on 4k uhd 25 frames per second output i am on a hundred thousand kilobits per second also i'm on main 10 as well and i don't have optimized for speed switched on audio is just going to be the same but this doesn't really matter because the audio codec won't really like have any impact whatsoever on the speed of these things so what i'm going to do here is just to add that to the render queue now let me get into that render there now once again just at the beginning here we will see this frame rate vary a fair bit as it hits these fusion elements here for the titles and then it'll just kind of even out for the best part after that and then carry on encoding through okay so what i'm going to do now is just speed through this and let's get to the end of it okay so we've got to the end there and as we can see that is three minutes and two seconds okay so what i'm going to do now is just have a quick look at these numbers and then let's just do a bit of a summary here so the ultra done this in two minutes and 37 seconds and the max done it in three minutes and six seconds now the ultra was obviously faster but it wasn't even 20 percent faster it was more like 18 percent something like that but let's just call it 20 percent and round it up now that 20 percent difference is not a reflection of the differences between the two computers now don't forget the ultra has got twice as many cpu cores it has also got 50 percent more gpu cores it has got twice the ram as well and also technically the ssd is also faster as well now given all of that we are only seeing just shy of 20 percent difference so somewhere along the line there i think we can definitely say that it is not anywhere near a linear scaling as far as any of the processing is concerned anyways i could just carry on rattling on here about all kinds of things and the things that i've noticed amongst a lot of different video tests that i've done but the one thing that i can say right now is that me personally i am very underwhelmed by the differences that we get with the ultra in comparison to the max anyway let me know in the comments what you think of the results here and why you think that these things are the way that they are i'm david harry thank you very much for watching this video take care and goodbye now